Okay, so it is seven o'clock. It is time to get going here. Um, to get going, as some would say. Um, I know that was a terrible pun. So today's lecture is about Git. Um, and so our objectives for today is basically to talk about Git, what it is, how it works, all that kind of stuff, and then um, the difference between Git and GitHub, which is a common misconception that they're the same thing, they're not, they're two very different things, as well as how to use Git in a very basic manner. So to start off, what is Git and why are we using it? So Git is a version control system. Um, actually, before I get into Git, um, two reminders, for, or actually one reminder. I, I put it in the announcements, but just to make sure, if you haven't filled out the project interest form, please go do that. Um, that's really important. Every student needs to do it. Um, it's a Google form. It takes like 10 minutes. Um, that determines what your group is for the project. Anyway, going back to Git. So Git is a version control system. And what that means is that it tracks the changes in computer files. So if I want to change like a file, like in Google Docs, if you've seen like the saving your changes, that's basically Git, except you can roll back to the previous ones. It allows for collaboration which, with developers, which is really nice because then instead of having to like pass around flash drives or upload it to Google Drive and download it back down, it's all in one place. So you don't have to worry about um, which version you're using and everything else. And then uh, Git is the most commonly used version control system. Um, somebody asked uh, where the project interest form is. It's in hashtag announcements. Um, the link is there. Um, yeah, it takes like five minutes to fill out. It's not that bad. Um, but yeah, so it's Git is the most commonly used version control system, and that's because of a variety of things, most importantly because it was one of the first, and everyone just kind of got used to it, and now uh, we just use it for everything. And as you can see there, Git is love, Git is life, as I referred to earlier. Um, so it's really important for everyone who is aspiring to do something in software engineering to learn Git because it's so widely used throughout the industry. So with that in mind, now that we know what Git is and why we're using it, um, let's talk about how Git helps us. So with a good understanding of Git and the use of good practices, every mistake that you can possibly make when uh, writing code is fixable or even preventable. So how does Git work? So conceptually, um, it does three things. It tracks changes in computer files. It allows for collaboration with others. And it allows you to revert back. I mentioned this before, but I'm just kind of making sure that everyone follows along. So looking at um, this computer here, right? So in this example, we're going to start talking about our friend John here. So John is working on a uh, project, and um, he's going to be working on a simple app or something. It doesn't really matter what, you can use Git for any type of project. So John wants to work on a project and wants to work with other people, be able to make sure that he can recover all of his changes, but doesn't know where uh, to go. So we're going to teach John a little bit about Git and why he should be using it. So John is going to start by creating a repository. And this is basically a fancy word for a folder. Um, it's a little bit more complex than that. but um, just imagine that a repository is a singular folder. So the first thing that you can do in uh, Git is basically make a commit. And what a commit does is it allows you to take a snapshot. Git will take a look at all the files, determine what changes you made, and then we'll say, OK, these are the changes that were made since the last commit. That's what this commit is. And then you can revert back to that commit as a way to restore files if the next time that you make a change you mess up or something goes wrong. So now let's talk about collaboration. So Welby um, has opted to help John out on his project and is wondering how to get started. So John now first needs to figure out a way to get his files to somewhere in the cloud or somewhere else so that Welby can access them. Because if John is sharing a flash drive or if they're plugging computers directly into each other, especially if you're using laptops and across campus, that becomes very annoying and hard to do. So instead, what John is going to do is he's going to upload it to the GitHub uh, remote repository. 
And so remote is basically this idea that all of your files can be uploaded somewhere else in the cloud so that you don't have to worry about them at all. And that way everyone can get a copy without having to worry about um, opening up ports on their computer, security issues, and uh, bad code being injected into their computer. It stays on the server so that you don't have to worry about your device. So John is what, gonna do what's called a push command. And don't worry, we're gonna get into the details about these later. The push command is going to take the code that John um, committed and it's going to push it up to GitHub. So now GitHub is going to have a copy of the code in the server um, that can be accessed anywhere. So now John is going to invite Welby to the repository on GitHub and is going to uh, tell him to clone it. So Welby is now going to clone, which is basically to download this repository for the first time. So Welby has now cloned the repository and you'll see now Welby has a copy of what John has. So now everyone is synced up and everyone is sharing the same files. And so um, one thing to note is that cloning is a one-time thing. As I mentioned before, this is like your initial download of the repository. After you do it once, you don't have to do it again. So now everyone has the same version of the repository across all different um, locations. But earlier we mentioned that Welby wants to collaborate. So let's see how Welby can now make a change and how John can receive it. So Welby just made a change. He turned um, the blue to the green. Um, I'm sorry if you're like, colorblind for, uh, for red, blue, or blue, green. This probably makes this a lot harder to see. But so you now see um, Welby's um, box right here is now green. So he made a change and he committed those changes. So now Welby has a more up-to-date version of the repository than the remote and John. So, um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, have Welby push his code up to the repository just like we saw John do before. So Welby now is going to push it back up and it's going to be even across um, Welby and GitHub. So now John needs to update his repository from remote. And in order to do that, he's going to use a new command because remember I said git cloning is a one-time thing. It's your initial download. So what John is going to do is he's going to run pull. And what git pull does is it says, okay, GitHub, what changes have happened since the last time I pushed? Can you send those over to me? GitHub will then send those changes over. John's repository will take them and it will apply the changes to his local version so that he has the exact same changes that everyone else now has. So now everyone's back up to date, no problems. And you'll notice that throughout this entire process, nobody had to I uh, directly send files to each other. Everything went through GitHub, so you don't have to be in the same place, you don't have to have access to each other's computers, and you're good to go. So, now, let's say Mary was talking to Welby, and Welby was talking about how he made a cool change to John's project, and Mary wanted to get involved too. So, at this point, we're going to have Mary also clone the repository, just like Welby did, and now, once Mary clones the repository, you see that um, everyone is now back up to date. Mary can now contribute, and you can do this for 100 other developers as well. So that's sort of a conceptual um, idea of how Git works from the top level. Um, somebody asked a question. Is it possible for data to not get pulled? Um, yes, sort of. So the answer is basically that um, you can make a repository private so that you don't have to, um, so that people can't even see the code and that way they can't pull it. But in general, um, you can't, like, if someone can see the code on GitHub, then they can pull it. Um, so what we're going to do now is we are going to do our first pull of the night. Um, so. All right, so I just created the first poll, and that is I wrote um, some code and nothing else. I haven't done any commands in Git. What do I need to do? What commands do I need to run in order to uh, let Welby see his code on my computer? Also, thanks, Eustace, for fixing the stream title. All right, so uh, make sure to uh, put your answers in Pollbot.
All right, um, I'm going to close the poll in about another 15 seconds. Okay. So the poll is now closed. And so the right answer is going to be as 84% of you guessed, three. And so the reason it's three is because going back to the example, remember, first, John made his change. He pushed it up to GitHub. Then after he pushed it to GitHub, then Welby, uh, let's go back a little bit further. Welby then uh, cloned, but then the other part to this is that when Welby pushed it back up, um, John could now pull. So it could be um, clone, but in this case, we didn't have clone as an option, so it's um, option three then. Okay, so um, let's go a little bit deeper into what these commands are actually doing, and let's talk about what Git is doing on a lower level. But first, I need to talk about a little bit of terminology just so that it makes a little bit more sense about what we're talking about. Um, so somebody asked what a commit is again. Basically, a commit is when uh, the um, when you type in the commit command, it will take a snapshot, like a picture of everything that you changed since the last commit that was made, so that you can see um, a version of your code. And then the idea is that once you've committed, you can then go back and um, like revert back to it, or you can see the changes that were made in that commit. So let's talk about the four environments in Git. So you have the working directory, the staging area, the local repository, and the remote repository. So the working directory is the first one we're going to talk about. This environment is the same as um, what your operating system knows. So this is just like a folder on your computer. And these are all of the files um, in that folder. So what's important to note is that earlier when I was talking about repositories, I said it was basically a folder. This is where that comes into play. A repository is typically going to contain all the files in the folder, but not always. A good example of when you wouldn't want to have something in your repository is like a password file or some sort of file that is important and like credit card numbers or whatever, right? You don't want to be sending that to GitHub and letting everyone read that. So you're going to leave that in the working directory so that you have easy access to it, but you're not going to be committing it so that everyone else can see it. Um, so let me just make sure that I talked about that. Yep. Okay. So another um, important thing is the staging area. The staging area is basically where you tell Git what, com uh, what files are going to get changed for... Um, for your command, so or for your commit. So basically, like if I changed um, like two different files, I would have to add those files to the staging area before I can commit. Otherwise, it's going to commit whatever's in the staging area, whether that um, has anything. If it doesn't have anything, then it's going to just simply uh, fail. So then we have the local repository. The local repository is the latest snapshot of all of your uh, like or is the snapshot of all of your past changes. So it's all of those pictures that Git took of your repository. So the idea is that you can have a Git uh, repository or a local repository where you don't have to worry about, um, say, putting it on GitHub, and you can just keep it for yourself if you have some sort of reason to do that. A good example is if like you're doing something, you're just trying to mess around with some code, and you don't know if you're actually going to continue using it then you can simply just leave it in your local repository and not actually push it to GitHub. So the remote repository, as I mentioned before, um, the big difference between this and the local repository is that others can take the version that's on the remote repository and then download it for themselves to help make changes. So it contains the history of all of the changes from your local repository, and it's basically just somewhere else for that code to live and for you to share those um, changes. So how do we move between these environments? Because there are four different things. It's kind of confusing, right? You have your working directory, your staging directory, local repository, remote repository. You have all these different names for places. It's getting kind of confusing, right? So the solution is 
to use a couple of commands. So the first one is you need to add, um, sorry for the formatting, that's supposed to say add, not AD, and then a D on the next line. You're going to get add from the working directory to the staging direct area. And so what that will do is it'll say, hey, get for the next commit that I make, make sure that this file gets put in that commit. And so that can be a change that you made to a file that's already in the repository, or it can be a brand new file, depending on what you've done in the last um, commit. So now we've uh, added the changes that we wanted to make in the staging area. We now need to transition from the staging area to the local repository. And so this is the act of taking that snapshot of what's in the staging area. So to do that, we use git commit. And so git commit will save the changes that we made to the local repository as a snapshot uh, or to the uh, working directory that are in the staging area to the local repository as a singular snapshot. So a good way to sort of describe this process is the working directory is just kind of like your kitchen table or whatever. And then your staging area is where, let's say, you're packing your lunch, right? You're putting all of the stuff inside of your lunch bag ready to get going. And then committing is wrapping up your lunch ready to go out the door. And then finally, to quote unquote go out the door, we go to the remote repository by using git push. And so this is going to transfer commits from that local repository to the, uh, or from the local repository to the remote repository. So those are the four working directories. Does anyone have any questions so far in terms of navigating between them from left to right? OK, so let's move on to the next sec. Um, yeah, sure, I can go over the uh, staging area real quick. Um, so, and snapshot. So yeah, um, the staging area is basically this idea that you have files that you've changed. Um, yeah, I can move the uh, face cam. I can turn it off. There we go. Um, so yeah, the idea with this is that the staging area is the, um, yeah, I can go back to the remote repository slide. Um, this one. Okay. So yeah, so going between these, I'll just go over it real quick again. Um, the working directory is just the folder where everything is stored on your computer. Um, then the staging area is basically where you say, hey, get, I made a change to, let's say, um, test.py. So you tell git, I'm going to git add the change to the staging area. So now the changes you made to uh, test.py stay in the staging area. Next, you then commit it, and it will say, okay, all of the changes that you made to um, test.py are now going to be saved to the local repository. And so it takes it a snapshot. So like if you were to basically create a zip file of the repository at that point, that's basically what git commit does. And then as I said, push will basically send it up to remote reposit up to the remote repository. So now that we've talked about um, moving between the environments, let's say that Welby made a change that we now want to see and move back the other way down. So as we talked about when we were doing the um, like uh, visual overview, Welby made a change. It's now in the remote repository. And to pull it back down, we're going to run git pull. And so git pull is going to say, if your remote has updated and you want the load, uh, if the remote has any updates, and you want those changes, it will basically take those changes and load them into the local repository. Um, and this gets a little bit more complex. Welby, I know you talked about this. Try not to uh, talk about the uh, merge command yet. We're going to get there in uh, Git Lecture 2. So now it's back on the local repository, and we are now back up to date with Welby. And remember that the local repository is in the working directory. So any changes made to the local repository show up in the working directory. And then the staging area is just kind of this idea that Git has in terms of whether, whether or not it's going to be committed in the next um, version or the next commit. So let's summarize for a little bit. Um, here is the first batch of Git commands, OK? 
So we have git add, which saves files to a um, staging area. Then we have git commit, which is going to commit files to the local repository. And then finally we have git push, which is going to transfer those commits from the local repository to the remote repository. So to get changes from remote, then we run git pull and we can get those changes back down to our local repository. And now we have two other commands that you don't really use as much. You usually do it like once or twice. Um, git init is basically going to add the .git folder to your directory, which basically says, hey git, I want to track this folder. Can you help me out? And it will allow git to do that. Then you have git clone, which is where you take a repository on the remote and download it to your uh, computer and set it up in whatever directory you run the command from. And then, um, so these six commands are, and specifically the first four there, are almost all of the commands you're going to run in Git for most of the time. And so these are a lot of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis is you make a change, you add it, you commit it, you push it, and then you go back, make another change, add, commit, push, and if someone else makes a change, you pull, and that is basically how you interact with Git. So... Now let's talk about interacting with Git through Bash, because you've probably been wondering um, how to actually add files um, and commit files and push uh, commits to the re remote repository. So let's talk about that. So how do we start this? First off, we need to git clone. So to do that, we're going to have a demo. So over here, I have a repository that we are going to pull. So let me set that up. So here we go. So we have git lecture one, okay? And so this is in the remote. I'm gonna click over here and I'm gonna say um, that we are going to clone it. So it's gonna give us this link here. We hit the copy button right there. And now we go over to bash. Then all we have to do is go to our desktop in this case. And then what I'm gonna do is git clone and uh, let me make that font a little bit bigger for everyone. Okay, so we're going to git clone, and then we're going to paste the link into the um, uh, command prompt. Um, so now we have our command ready. We're going to hit go, and or hit enter, and it's now going to reach out to GitHub. It's going to log me in because I've already used git on this uh, machine, and you'll see here it says cloning into git lecture one, and then it's going to get all of the changes that were made, unpack them and load them in. So now if we go to git dash lecture one, um, you'll now see we have this uh, folder. And so if we open it up, we have a readme.md file. And if I uh, vim into that readme.md file, you'll see it'll say git lecture one just like it does in remote. So that is cloning. Um, and so now let's say I want to make a change. So I'm going to I uh, create a file called um, coolstuff.py. And so now I'm going to uh, go into that and we're going to just say print hello world. Okay. And so this is just a simple Python script. Um, and so now I want to commit it. So let's try doing that. And to do that, we're going to do git commit. And then at the end, we're going to add a message. So we'll say, added cool stuff dot pi. So now when I hit enter, it's going to say, hey, nothing was added to the commit because um, there wasn't anything in the staging area. So this basically means that, hey, we couldn't actually commit anything and instead um, we just kind of left it there. But hey, there is an untracked file for you to commit. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about our first workflow. So our first workflow is add, which we just talked about, which brings it from the local, um, the directory to the staging area. Then, um, oh, actually, so there are a bunch of different ways to use git add. So the first one is I could do um, git add coolstuff.py, and that will work. I can also add uh, readme.md if I had made any changes there and just list off all the files I changed. But obviously that's pretty slow and kind of annoying to do. So instead, let's talk about git add dash dash all versus add dot. So git add dash dash all is going to stage all the changes that have 
been made to the repository. So it's going to add any files that you change. Then git add uh, dot is going to add all of the files in the current directory or below. So remember in bash dot is the current directory. So it's going to add everything in that directory and then everything below, um, but not everything above. Git add dash u is going to stage modifications and deletions, but not the new files. So if I did git add dash u um, to this, coolstuff.py would not get committed or added, but instead um, readme.md would. So in this case, we're gonna add coolstuff.py because that's the uh, file that we changed. And you'll see it just worked. So now if I do git status, we'll see changes to be committed. So this is basically the staging area. So it says new file, because we added a new file, coolstuff.py. So now um, the next step is to commit it. And to do that, as I showed before, we're gonna run git commit uh, dash m, and then we're gonna put a message. So in this case, added coolstuff.py. And this message should be kind of clear, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it basically should be something so that if someone else were to read your commit messages, they know what you did in that specific commit. So we're gonna commit, and you'll see it, we created a commit, and it'll say one file changed, one insertion, and then it'll tell us um, that we changed uh, coolstuff.py. So that's commit, and now let's git push. So if I do git push, it's going to tell us that it's compressing everything and then it's going to push it up. And now if we go over to GitHub on the repository over here, if we refresh, now you'll see coolstuff.py is now in there and it'll say, here's the commit. So if we actually look at that commit, we'll take a look at the snapshot that was made. So in this case, the snapshot that was made was that, hey, coolstuff.py had this line added to it. And that's all that got changed in this snapshot. So now we can see that, but we can also hit this browse files button and look at the repository at that commit. But we can also go back, um, go back to the original commit. And so if we go to this one right here, you'll see it talks about adding this initial readme and you'll see that the original file is gone now. If we go back to main, it's back. And so we can go back and forth and look at the snapshots in the past. So, that's our first workflow. And so I just demoed that. Now let's talk about changes on the remote that we want to bring in locally. So I would have used this login and help me out here, but that's gonna to be too much of a pain. It's gonna take him too long. So we're just gonna take a little bit of a shortcut here. And we're gonna pretend that he did this um, on his side. Now you'll see that I just hit this uh, like little pencil here. You usually don't want to do this. Committing via GitHub is usually not a good idea for a variety of reasons, um, but the biggest one is that um, it just kind of makes things messy. It's really only for small changes like this. So let's say in this case, we're changing hello world to hello CS196. In that case, yeah, that's a small enough change where it's not an issue. And we'll say change world to CS196. And then we are going to hit commit. And so let's just pretend that Eustace made that change, okay? Now, let's run git pull. So to uh, pull, all we do is type git and then pull, pretty simple. And now it's going to bring it back down. It'll say fast forward. It tells us coolstuff.py was changed and there were two changes. There was one line added and one line removed. And you can see that based on the one plus and the one minus. If there were more than like 50 or something like that, it will basically treat it as if it's a percentage of additions versus deletions. You can also see that down here as just raw numbers. So now if we go into um, that file, which is coolstuff.py, you'll see it says hello CS196. And remember, we didn't have to open up our computer. We didn't have to have anyone else take a look at the files. All they had to do was go to the website. And so this makes it a lot safer instead of having to deal with anything crazy. So that is git pull. Um, and I just ran the demo. So now we have another poll. So let me um, create the uh, poll. Um, poll create. Okay. So the question is, I have an older file that I'm currently coding in. Where should this file live? 
So this is something that you um, already have put, like you've already committed this file, but now you're probably making a change to it. So which um, area is this um, file going to be in? Is it going to be in the local repository? Is it going to be in the staging area, the remote repository? Where within the, um, within the structure here is this file going to be? And remember, I said that it's already been committed. So there's one, I think I said one answer. Let me see. Okay, yeah, so there are technically two answers, but um, one is more correct than the other. So you're not technically wrong, but there is one specific answer that I am looking for um, in this case. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Okay, so it looks like um, about half of you selected um, the working directory and then about 35% um, percent of you selected staging area. So this one, honestly, is a very tricky question. I probably would have gotten it wrong if I were a student too. So it is essentially in all four places, as someone in the chat said. Um, but importantly, it is in um, the working directory because it's obviously um, somewhere on your system. But then also, it's likely in your staging area because you're now currently coding it. So you've probably get added it as you're making these changes and you're going to commit it later. So it's likely going to be in your staging area, although one is also correct. And then three is also correct, too. It just kind of depends. And then, yes, four is right. But if four is right, three is right. So up to you at that point. So this is a bit of a trick question, um, but it's essentially all of them. So now our next question is going to be um, poll create. So you now have a file with some changes from three hours ago that are part of a larger feature that you've been working on alone, right? So I've been working on something. I went to go grab dinner. I went to go talk to Eustace about CS196. And now I came back and I um, have like taken a look at it again. So where is this change, or where is this file going to live? Okay, well, I will say that this one is a little bit clearer because um, there is one best answer to this one. Okay, I'm going to give everyone another five seconds to finish up their answers. Okay, so it looks like the most popular answer was two, which is the staging area. And this is actually going to be incorrect. Um, so in this case, you have a larger file with some changes that you made, um, or you have a file with some changes that you made, but it's part of a larger feature. So in actuality, it's going to be the local repository because you've already committed it because you stepped away. You're not going to remember what you did. So you want to write a commit message saying, hey, I did this. And that way it's a future note to yourself. So it's in the local repository, although depending on your habits, it could also be in the staging area. It really shouldn't be in the working directory because it needs to be added because at this point it should have been late um, or it's a little bit late. And then the remote repository it kind of depends on your usage habits. I don't always push to remote unless I've made a couple of changes that I know finish the feature. Um, so why you need to commit it is because in reality, you're not going to remember something three hours ago. You're going to remember most of it, but you're going to start to forget about, hey, why did I do this? Why did I do that? And the changes you want to be making should really be... Um, put into the local repository as soon as possible. So that way you kind of have an awareness of what you're doing. Um, and as someone said, what if you spill dinner on your computer? 
then you're kind of in a uh, bad spot. Um, but also, if you're committing, um, you should really just kind of do that. Two is technically also possible, but three is the best answer to this one. So, poll number three here. Let me open up the poll. Okay, so this one is basically, you have a file with some changes um, and you made them three hours ago, but you're working on a larger feature that other people are also helping you with. Where should this one be? And if anyone says this one's ambiguous too, I am telling you it is not. So if that isn't a big enough hint, I don't know what is. All right, another 10 seconds or so. Okay, so yeah, 93% of you said uh, four, which is correct. So the remote repository is where it should be because when you want other people to work on it, maybe I push it up and then I message you says, hey, I pushed up my code, can you take a look and maybe make some changes um, that you think are good? So this is a perfect example of where the uh, remote repository is best. Okay, so now, the next question I'm going to ask, let me create the next bot. Is you have a file with passwords, okay? And so these might be passwords, your credit card, whatever. Um, where should you be putting this file? Uh, the answer to the previous one was four, which is the remote. Because remember, you're letting um, people change the file that you're collaborating on them with. So yeah, you have a file with your passwords, or maybe you have a file with like important customer information. Let's say like it's um, customer information and their emails and um, a hashed password. Okay, we're going to be a little bit better. Okay. Um, where should this file be? Okay, so I am now going to close the poll. Okay, so it seems like there was a uh, pretty close split, split between one and three. So in this case, first off, let me just give a little rant. Don't store your passwords on your computer at all. Generally a bad idea. Um, but if you are going to do it, another good example is where you're using an API key where no human can really remember an API key. So with this case, you're going to want to do uh, one because you want it in your working directory so that way you have it accessible, but you don't want to add it to your repository because remember, once you commit it, it's going on to GitHub and it is staying there. So now anyone who goes looking around can go find that file. Okay, so instead you want to um, be using your working directory. So the people that said local repository, I understand what you were trying to get at, but in this case, if you put it into your local repository, if you commit it, then the next time you push, it's going to end up in your remote repository. So that's why you want to keep it in your working directory. Okay, so um, now we're going to talk about something that I personally love. I know a lot of people hate it. A lot of people, um, it's very controversial. Um, and that's the idea of conventional commits. So let me bring that over here somehow, maybe. Here we go. So conventional commits are this idea that every commit should have a type and then a, an optional scope and then a description. So remember when we were committing, we basically just said, hey, I uh, changed world to CS196. So this is a good description, but it doesn't really tell us what it is or why we did it or anything like that. So in this case, what conventional commits do is it um, will say everything has to have a type. So in this case, it could be a fix, a feat, 
um, which is a feature, a breaking change, which will break everything um, that uses this later on. Um, and there's a bunch of others down here. You can go read through this yourselves um, once the slides are posted. And then um, it will have a description. So in this case, you can kind of see an example. Um, it's really important that if you do decide to do this, you keep yourself consistent because otherwise it just becomes a mess. But if you keep yourself consistent, this allows you to be much more organized with your commits. I personally love it. I personally use it all the time. I know people who will literally type like three letters for their commit messages. But in general, you should be um, striving to make your Git commits as legible as possible, not only for others, but also for yourself. Because there have been countless times where I've been saved by my conventional commits, looking back and reading, oh, okay, that's why I did that. So you're not going to be tested on that, but it's a really interesting idea, and you should really take a look at it if you um, like the idea of keeping your commits organized. So that being said, I do have a uh, joke to kind of round us out here. Um, in case of fire, commit, push, then leave building. Um, probably should also mention don't actually do this. Bad idea. Um, if there's a fire alarm, actually leave the building. Um, yeah, not much else to say on that. So announcements. We are at the end of the lecture. Hooray, you have made it through. Get lecture one, okay? Almost out. We have two more Git lectures to get through, and then you will all be the best at Git ever. So Git homework. Number one is going to be due on February 11th at midnight. Um, and in this case is going to basically be um, a repository that you make and you're going to make changes to it and it allows you to kind of use Git in a real world environment. So the homework is not going to be on Prairie where the homework team is going to announce how that's going to work. But essentially you're going to be creating it on the GitHub dev. So the project interest forms have already come out. That's a uh, mistake from before I uh, realized when this was happening. But so the project interest forms have already come out, are already out. You should have filled it out by now. If you haven't filled it out, fill it out right now. Okay. It is like due tomorrow. If you do not fill it out and we find out, then we're probably just going to put you in whatever random group there's room for. And please, 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 use campus wire we got a lot of questions this last weekend um people just randomly pm myself eustace the homework team being like hey i need help and that's not really how discord is supposed to be used in this class if you have a question about the homework it should live on campus wire okay just like you add um changes that you're putting into the staging directory you add questions that you have to the campus wire and then finally Office hours are scheduled. Um, they are on Campus Wire and Discord. In case you aren't sure, though, it's Monday, Wednesday, Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon and from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Central Time, so Champagne Time. Um, so that's all the announcements I have. Also, not really an announcement, but um, another thing that you should probably do, we had a lot of fun on Tuesday, is going to the... Um, CS196 socials, not mandatory at all, but it's a lot of fun and uh, you get to meet a bunch of different people, including course staff like myself, Eustace, and everyone else. So that's all the announcements I have. Um, I'm going to stick around for questions for the next seven, eight minutes, and then uh, that's it. If you have questions, feel free to stick around. Otherwise, um, feel free to head out.